products and everything we're going to need. If we don't have the industries of the future, we don't have a future. Real quick, we have 30 seconds here. Are you going to get a NAFTA deal done? I mean, the next 20 days, they have got the Mexican elections. Uh, should we? I mean, if this whole tariff was about NAFTA and you didn't get a deal done in the next 20 days, was it worth it? When will a, NAFTA, a new NAFTA deal happen? Ambassador Robert Lighthizer, come back to him. He's a very tough negotiator. Yeah. Uh, in it's, it's his lane. The president wants to get this done. He wants to get it uh, done. All right. And we hope it gets done. We got a jump. great day for America. Peter Navarro, good to see you, sir. Take care, Maria. We'll be right back. Welcome back. And back to our top story. President Trump planning to meet with Kim Jong-un in May of this year to discuss denuclearizing the North. Joining me right now to talk about the potential risks and rewards from such a sit-down, Ambassador John Bolton. He is a former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, a senior fellow at the American in uh, Enterprise Institute and a Fox News contributor. Great to see you, sir. Thanks very much for joining us. Glad to be with you. What do you think about this meeting? Well, I think obviously the president's uh, turned things on their heads as he, as he does so often, and it's uh, confused a lot of people in uh, Washington. Uh, I think uh, basically what he's saying, and he reiterated his thinking in his speech in Pennsylvania uh, last night, is that uh, with the North Koreans very close to achieving the objective they sought for so long of being able to target uh, cities in the United States with nuclear weapons, uh, it's time to cut through uh, the, the usual diplomatic procedure uh, and say we're prepared to talk right at the top. But I don't think this is the beginning of a six-month, nine-month, 12-month process. I think this could actually uh, could be a very short meeting, should be a very short meeting. The issue is will North Korea denuclearize? And the way they can prove that uh, is by agreeing to ship their nuclear weapons program to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is where, for example, the Libyan nuclear weapons program now sits. And if they're not willing to discuss that, there's not much to discuss. Well, what, what are they willing to discuss, Ambassador? We've heard from them before in terms of saying we are not denuclearizing. We are not giving up our nuclear ambitions. Now, the administration will say the tough talk on the part of the president has actually brought them to the table to even consider it. Here's Stephen Mnuchin with me, the Treasury Secretary, this past week on Fox Business. Listen to this. We believe that sanctions work. They, they worked in our... <laughs> Do you agree with that, that this, these sanctions have actually worked? Because some people say sanctions don't work. Why would a killer or someone who doesn't care about human rights care about sanctions? Yeah. Well, let me go back to the to the premise for a minute. I, I don't I don't think uh, Kim Jong Un wants to engage in the kind of conversation with the president I just described. He wants negotiations. He wants conventional months of preparation, months of discussion at the lower levels to buy him time to finish. Uh, the, the still uncompleted tasks to get that deliverable nuclear weapons capability. He's trying to uh, throw sand in our eyes, and I think the president uh, isn't falling for that. Uh, and I'd have to say, I think sanctions have played, at best, a minor role. What has Kim Jong-un's attention, that he ha has not had his attention or his father's, uh, is the threat that we will use military force to destroy his nuclear weapons program. Mm -hmm. I think he's scared to death of that. I think he's scared to death that Donald Trump actually means what he says, uh, unlike Barack Obama, who could say all options are on the table like he was brushing his teeth. He just didn't mean it. Yeah, well, I think now they know it's serious. But By the way, it's, the Chinese don't like the military THAAD system either. Uh, in that part of the world. So talk to us about China and how they view this. They're out this morning in one of the state uh, newspapers saying China will not be marginalized in any talks. It's our, w you can attribute the good news that they are perhaps talking to China. So what's your take on China's involvement? Well, basically, China's jived us for 25 years. They've said repeatedly they don't want North Korea with nuclear weapons, and they've done precious little to change that. They could uh, eliminate Kim Jong-un's regime uh, very easily. I, I think, frankly, it's in China's own national interest to see the Korean Peninsula reunited. I think we should be having uh, talks on that. I wish we had started a long time ago. But I think it's time to tell China, when we say we want denuclearization, we mean we want it now. And let's, let's be clear. 
the, the difference between our current situation and prior diplomatic efforts is technological. North Korea is very close to accomplishing what it's been after. CIA Director Mike Pompeo has used the phrase recently that they're a handful of months away. So mm -hmm. elaborate diplomatic negotiations, toughening sanctions, boat by boat by boat, isn't going to do the trick. Yeah, you know, you, you raise an interesting point. I want to ask you about Iran and how Iran fits in here, but let me stay on this for a moment because we just heard from Kevin McCarthy, the majority leader, who's saying, look, we need to look at China. Peter Navarro as well saying China is stealing all of our intellectual property. They're going to come out with something, this administration, uh, in terms of uh, getting their arms around what China has been doing to America for so long, whether it be tariffs or what have you. What do you want to see in terms of this next couple of weeks, what's going to be coming out of this White House against China as it relates to tariffs? Well, I think, frankly, we'd get their attention better on North Korea if we were tougher on their violations of their international trade obligations. Let's just take intellectual property. I think American and, and European companies would say virtually unanimously that any technology they put into China is at risk of being pirated. And yet for years we've let them get away with it. China has, has pursued a mercantilist policy within the WTO and for far too long they haven't been called on it. I think you get China's respect when you stand up to them. I think they, as long as they think Americans can be pushed around on trade, they surmise, not illogically, we can be pushed around on other things, too. How does Iran fit into this North Korea story? Well, I'm very worried uh, that it fits in and, and go in the other direction. I, I've, I've uh, been saying recently North Korea is part of the Middle East. I think the linkages between Iran's ballistic missile program and North Korea's uh, are indisputable, and I think there's every reason to believe that they're closely working together on, on the nuclear side as well. And even if that's completely wrong, the fact is in Iran you have a relatively rich country seeking nuclear weapons technology. In North Korea you have a desperate desperately poor country that has nuclear weapons technology. Any trouble seeing the structure of that transaction? That's why North Korea is a threat, not simply in Asia and the Pacific. It is a global threat. It will sell that technology to anybody with cash to buy it. Real quick before you go, Ambassador, there is speculation that you may be offered a job in the White House, uh, NSA director. Are you readying to take that job? You know, I never discuss that subject. I'm very boring whenever whenever the personnel issues get raised. It's a long, long-standing uh, view of mine not to discuss it. We don't think you're boring, Ambassador. It is good to see you, sir. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining Thank us. Thank you very much. All right, Ambassador Glad John to be Bolton here. there. Coming up, President Trump's new steel tariff sparking debate as some experts warn the move will hurt the U.S. economy, not help. Our panel next on the potential fallout. We will hear from the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal as we look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures. Stephen Mnuchin with me this past week, confident in President Trump's new tariffs on steel and aluminum imports. That comes amid growing concerns. The new policy could eventually hurt the economy in the long run. Our panel now, Mary Kissel is an editorial board member of The Wall Street Journal. James Freeman is an assistant editor at The Wall Street Journal editorial page. Both are Fox News contributors. Great to see you both. Good morning, Mary. And I've been Good teasing we're going to have the editorial board here because it's been the editorial <laughs> board that's been really the loud voice in the room to say, Mr. President, stop. Right? Yeah, well, look, uh, you had Peter Navarro on your show earlier today. He made incredibly disingenuous arguments, Maria. You heard him say time and time again, this is a national security issue. No, it isn't. We only need less than 3% of U.S. steel capacity for the defense industry. So I have a problem with that argument, which is the premise for all of these actions against China. Secondly, uh, President Trump could be opening up markets and, and making America more competitive and gaining job opportunities for Americans and forcing countries like China to change their practices because they want our business. That doesn't gamble with American jobs. But by playing chicken in the way that he has in threatening tariffs, he's gambling with American jobs, gambling that he's going to open up markets. I much prefer the other approach. What about the fact that he's exempted so many uh, industries? And in terms of uh, national security, James, he said, look, if we have a national security relationship with another country, you can come out and say, look, push back on the tariffs and maybe you'll get exempt. Yeah, he's uh, exempted some countries, uh, obviously more countries seeking it. I, 
I think maybe, and the hope here is that he pays more attention to the stock market than to Peter Navarro, because <laughs> when he rolled out the idea, stocks got hammered, really beyond the actual harm of the steel and aluminum tariffs because of a fear that this was starting a very bad cycle. And you see, as he's moderated, investors kind of relaxed a little, but it's uh, it's very clear what the market is telling him if he wants to listen. Don't start a trade war. Because, because on that first day when he first announced announced this. Uh, that day, Justin Trudeau, I think he was at a conference or something, and he said, I am willing to walk. And that's yeah. when the Dow went down 1,000 points. So, well, right, that's what markets reacted to, the fact that if they're going to be just as bullheaded as we are, we have a big problem. Well, and also remember, Justin Trudeau has his own domestic politics to deal with. Canada is a democracy. He has to be seen as standing up for the interests of Canadians. That's just a reality. Yeah. But, Maria, I'd point out another very disingenuous argument that Peter Navarro just made on your show, which is the, con the quote-unquote concern about trade deficits. This is a false argument. Trade deficits are not budget deficits. A trade deficit is the opposite of a capital surplus. We grow grow when we have trade deficits. So what's, deficits. The, what's the answer to that? I mean, what, what is the answer to the fact that we are on the losing end? Of all, uh, but, but look, you've got $375 billion in deficit with China. But again, I just told you, trade deficits don't have to be repaid. We have trade deficits when the buying power of Americans is strong. Mm -hmm. We grew with trade deficits in the 1980s and the 1990s. Peter Navarro has no answer for that because nobody ever asks well, him what about, what about Well, what about the fact that China is stealing all of our stuff, James? I mean, well, what, what about the fact that we need to do something to, to stop China from acquiring some of the most important industries of the future, like AI, like robotics. What do you do? Yeah, I think the China-specific uh, issue, it is a problem, and it's a, it's a communist dictatorship at the end of the day. Their, their uh, leader now uh, ruling for life, uh, the first since Mao to have this power. So, so I think China is a specific case. It's a, it's a constant problem. We hear from U.S. executives doing business there. They... Uh, it, the intellectual property theft is out of control. Right. We have ways to address that. We could, under our laws, under uh, WTO, there, there are sanctions. And, and I think if, if they get back to focusing on Chinese theft, right. yeah. then they're in good shape. If they start talking about deficits generally, look, we yeah. run they're trade surpluses issues. and services with lots of countries. We don't uh, want that to end. Let's take a short break and continue this conversation more with our panel as we look ahead on Sunday Morning Futures. Back in a minute. And back with our panel now, Mary Kissel and James Freeman. I want to go back to something that uh, Peter Navarro said in terms of the Chinese investing in America. The issue that he's trying to say, James, is that China is investing in our important technology and then acquiring those companies and then just competing with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you're talking about China or a Chinese company, often a state-backed enterprise, uh, seeking to control the semiconductor industry that's in all uh, mobile phones, then you do have a national security question. But uh, he also talked broadly about investment from overseas in the United States as if it's a bad thing. It's not. This is how we create jobs. This is uh, one of the reasons we're so optimistic and we've seen such good results initially out of the tax cut is we want capital coming into the United States instead of fleeing. They're going to do something on China the next couple of weeks, but you say this is already something in place. Yeah, again, the administration likes to conflate non-issues with real problems. Non-issue is the trade deficit, not a problem. It's the opposite of a capital surplus. I just want to keep repeating that. There is an issue with China stealing intellectual property, and we need to protect certain industries. But we already have a panel called CFIUS, right. Maria, the Committee on Foreign Investment. Um, and it is looking at things like the Broadcom Qualcomm proposed deal. Okay. So if Trump wants to get tough on China, he wants to prevent you know, what James is talking about, taking over right, important industries or technologies. Yeah. He already has the vehicle to do that, and he's already toughened it up. I think that's great. I think he should continue to do so. Let me, let me take you back here to America. Tuesday, you've got a special election in Pennsylvania. Is that going to be a proxy, you think, for the midterms, James? I think certainly the Republicans in the House are looking at it that way, yeah. even though these districts are about to get redrawn for the fall. Well, so it's the really a symbol. That. I'm yeah. thinking, well, what, that doesn't sound it, very good. It's a symbolic uh, uh, race here, but it's important as, as kind of, and I know House Republicans are looking at this as kind of a barometer because Trump won the district by 19 in 2016, uh, because it's, uh, it seems like.